Well, good evening, Grace Bible Church. I can see the sense of gravitas already as we gather here tonight, and that's a good thing. Uh, Good Friday is a moment for us to consider what it took for us to be saved. It is an opportunity and a special night for us of, honestly, grief, but also of grace and of gratitude. For those of you who have been joining us for the past few days, we've sat here together, we've read through scripture, we've sang, we've prayed, and tonight is just going to be a continuation of that narrative all the way through. We'll be reading through Matthew 26 and 27. We'll be walking with Christ as he walks to the cross. And so let's ask God to take this time, this moment together, this time of silence before him to quiet our minds, to prepare our hearts, that we would hear him speak and so be transformed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, as awful as it is, it is indeed a good Friday, for today is the day that our sins were dealt with. Today is the day that made our forgiveness possible because of your Son. Because you were willing to give and he was willing to go, we have salvation. And for that, Lord, we stand amazed, we stand joyful, we stand complete in you. So, Lord, as we speak your word, as we remember the path of your son, as, his, as he walked to the cross, let us always, Lord, be considering what it cost for us to be saved. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here, watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup from me pass. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me even one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for a second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with a great crowd, with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me then. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Heavenly Father, as we think of your Son, Lord Jesus, as we consider the betrayal that Judas brought upon you, we pray, Lord, this day that you would reveal our hearts to us, that we would see 
the ways that we've acted in turn the same way and put ourselves first, thinking that we would manipulate you and your kingdom into doing what we want instead of what you want. Jesus, we pray that we would set aside our agendas and pray with you, not my will, but thine. We thank you, Lord, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you guys to stand and join us for this first song.
Please be seated. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered together. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him and said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth as well. And again, he denied it, this time with an oath. I do not know the man. And after a little while, while the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you two are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse upon himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And then he went out and wept bitterly. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we read in these words the treatment you received at the high council, how you were spit upon and struck and mistreated. And as painful as that that was for you, Lord, we think of the pain of the betrayal of Peter. Lord, we recognize that in our day-to-day lives, we often do deny you, maybe not the way Peter did, maybe not with such forceful words, but Lord, with our choices. We choose to go our own way or we choose to fit in with the current. Lord, forgive us of this. We thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness that you bought for us on the cross. Remind us, Lord, of what you went through and what it took to save us. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Died he for me who 
caused his pain for me who him to death pursued amazing love how can it be that thou my god should die for me amazing love how can it be that thou my god should die for me earth's throne above so free so infinite his grace emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race tis mercy all immense and free for oh my god it found out me amazing love how can it be that thou my god should die for me no condemnation now i dread jesus and all in When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since this is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. So when they'd gathered, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release, Barabbas 
or Jesus who is called Christ. For he knew that it was out of envy they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with this righteous man, for I've suffered much because of him in a dream today. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. The governor asked them again, saying, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas! Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the children answered, His blood be upon us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put a charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right, And one on his left, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel, let him come down, come come down now from the cross. And then we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Lord Jesus, let these words sink into our souls. Let us remember this day, indeed every day of our lives, what you took on our behalf. The mistreatment, though innocent, we thank you, Lord, for your death for us. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing that you shed upon us, for it is a sign of your deep love for us. And we thank you, Lord. It was the Father's good will to put you to death, and it was your choice to die in our stead. We pray, Lord, that this would be forever the sign and the ultimate symbol of your love for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father turns his face away 
Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, leba sambachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling for Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what had taken place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this is the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. You know, those words of Christ on a cross that loathsome afternoon nearly 2,000 years ago were not new. They were already by that time 1,000 years old. These words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, were first spoken by King David in Psalm 22. 
In uttering these ancient words, Christ was identifying the heart's cry of David and giving a signal to those who would hear, even we here tonight, that he is indeed the foretold Messiah. Psalm 22, verse 1 in its entirety says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? In that moment, Christ is crying out to the Father in despair and desperation and pain. Yet God the Father would not save his Son from the torments of a death on the cross because through Christ, according to the divine will of God, he was saving us. And there was no other way. We struggle to grasp the significance and mystery of the eternal and beloved Son of God, the one who dwelled with the Father and the Spirit in perfect love, communion, and holiness. We ask, how could he be rejected and forsaken by God, our Father? The truth is, is that we cannot know the mind of God in this mystery of the divine will. We can only embrace the truth by faith that this was necessary for our redemption. Again, there was no other way. Though we cannot know how God the Father could look upon the death of his beloved son, we can know why. The scriptures reveal to us three important reasons that God the Father abandoned God the Son on that awful day. First, it was part of God's eternal plan. Before the creation of the world and the eternal plan of God, the persons of the Trinity made a covenant with one another. This is what some theologians call the covenant of redemption. In this covenant, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit eternally assumed roles in the redemption of humanity from their sin. Well, wait, you mean that God knew that we would sin even before he created anything, even before he uttered those first creative words, let there be light? Yes. God in his perfect knowledge and omnipotence knew that we would need redemption after falling from our first state of perfection through the disobedience and rebellion of Adam. Now this is a mystery. Why would God allow this? Why would God allow all this suffering in the world? I don't know. This question has plagued humanity, Christian and otherwise, since the dawn of time. But what is clear from every single page of Scripture is that God is in control and that God has always had a plan. That plan would include each person of the Trinity. The Father willed redemption, Jesus would accomplish redemption, and the Spirit would apply it in the lives of God's children. Jesus accomplished redemption for God's people on a cross at Calvary. Secondly, the Father abandoned the Son because of our sin. Christ died to pay the sin debt we held before a holy and righteous God. On the cross, Christ took the punishment for our transgressions and our iniquities. When our Holy Father looked upon our righteous brother Jesus, he saw only our sin. Because our God is holy and just and righteous, he cannot and will not simply look upon sin. So Christ became sin, the one who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of Christ. This has been called the great exchange. God in his holiness poured out his righteous wrath against sin, even upon his own son who did nothing to deserve it. We might ask ourselves, how is this fair? For who would punish an innocent one for the transgressions of the guilty? Only one who knew that taking the righteous punishment would be of his own free will. Psalm 22 tells us that Christ on the cross was poured out like water and that all his bones wrought of joint, his heart was like wax melting within his breast for anguish. His strength dried up like a potsherd, his tongue stuck to his jaws, that he was laid in the dust of death. This he endured because that is what it took to take our sin upon himself that we might be forgiven, be made righteous, and be restored to our first purpose, to reflect the image of God. On the cross, Christ reflected to the Father the perfect image of sinful man. 
so that we could reflect the image of a perfect man, Jesus. When we look to the cross, let us see ourselves. Let us see our sin. When I came in, I looked through all of them, doing a checklist in my heart. What about that one? What about that? All of them. And the truth is that all of you have been guilty of them as well. Later on when we take communion, I encourage you, as you come forward to receive the elements, to look upon the cross, to consider the sin in your heart, the sin for which Jesus died. Let us see our punishment upon the cross, the one we deserved. Only then, let us see Christ hanging there upon the tree in our stead. The final reason the Father abandoned the Son upon the cross, believe it or not, is his great love for us. The Father gave the Son, and the Son willingly laid down his life for us out of that great love. When we consider the love of God toward us, who must never sever God's love with us with the atoning death of Christ on the cross. The cross is the highest, most comprehensive demonstration of God's love for his people. Christ came to die that we might live. As we read the account of Gethsemane, don't you just feel the dread of death coming upon Jesus? Yet he, for the joy set before him, endured that pain for us. Before the creation of the world, the Trinity, after needing nothing nor anybody to complete their blessed existence, desired to share the love they shared among each other with more. The great love of God is on display toward us in the dying words of Jesus. Think about this. The great love of God for us is manifested in the dying words of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God went to the final and most ultimate ends to regain that which we lost. He gave everything that we might be given back what our own apathy, self-centeredness, and pride marred in ourselves, the imago Dei, the image of God. The Father, for love, turned his face from his own beloved Son that we might be reborn, redeemed, and re-infused with a love for God, a reflection of the love shown to us in Christ on the cross. This is the heaviest, most momentous truth we can ever hold in our hearts. This is human history, everything right here, this day, the cross. And it all cries for a response. So what is it going to be? I believe that there are three ways that we must respond to the truth of God's plan of salvation, Christ's redemptive death on our behalf, and the love he manifested for us on the cross. First, we should all grieve. We should all grieve. We have felt grief in some form or another. I mean, think about it. We've grieved the death of a loved one. We've grieved the loss of a friendship or a job or a career. We've even grieved the recent loss of our most favorite sports teams. But do we ever grieve our sin or the death that was necessary to pay for it? Let us with open eyes look at the sin in our hearts and recognize the immensity of the sacrifice necessary to deal with it. Look at your hearts and then look at the cross. It's so easy for us to minimize our wickedness in our hearts apart from Christ. I was driving here, I was in a left-hand turn lane over on St. Charles in 83. And someone was on their phone when the light turned green and everyone got stuck. And I was running late to get here to the church. And so everyone's honking, we finally go. The light goes yellow. And I watched the last person turning off of St. Charles onto 83, the one who blocked everything up. And I looked at him and I thought, I wish I could just drive over this median and hit his car. the wickedness in our hearts, we minimize it. Why was my first response that? Why is your first response that? We minimize it. 
We blame others and ignore our sin, distracting ourselves by focusing on helping others overcome theirs. Yet it is God's will that we see our sin through God's eyes. And the very best way of doing that is by looking at the cross. We grieve. Now, lest we believe that God's will for our lives is groveling before him, let us recognize that grief by itself serves us nothing in the Christian walk. Grief equals death. Grief alone equals death. Some of us walk in the land of self-abnegation, and it does not honor God. It keeps us stuck in our suffering and perpetuates the cycle of sin in our lives. We must move beyond grief to something more. Grace. The second response is to receive God's grace for you and that it's sufficient to overcome any and every sin, past, present, and future. Our salvation is rooted entirely in God's mercy, shed upon us for Christ's sake. Before we could do anything, say any words, think any thoughts, God had already made a plan to save us from the penalty, power, and presence of sin in our lives. We were once blinded by the sin in our hearts, our minds darkened, but God, being rich in mercy, opened our eyes to the truth and implanted within us a seed of faith that through it we might be forever secure in Christ Trusting and obeying the one who died to pay a debt we could never repay. But we need to receive that grace. We often live our lives saved by grace, all the while wasting our time trying to earn what's already been freely given to us in the Lord. And worse, we sometimes seek to take credit for our apparently righteous thoughts, words, actions, deeds by looking at them and telling ourselves that God loves us and that God accepts us on the basis of them. Let us simply embrace the grace that God has lavished upon us in Christ and realize that there is nothing we can do to keep, earn, or deserve his loving acceptance. We need to tell ourselves we are more messed up, more sinful than we can ever imagine. Yet, yet, God's grace is far beyond our wildest dreams. You mean I've done this and I can? Yes. God's grace is sufficient to cover everything. Everything. Wow. Our only response left is gratitude. I mean, what other reasonable response is there? We've done nothing to receive salvation. We can do nothing to keep salvation. We were blinded in our sin and God out of his grace and mercy, knowing what we needed before we needed it, planned that we too could become children of God. We've been granted the biggest gift we could ever hope to receive and delivered from the holy wrath of our righteous God. And we are seated with Christ in heaven where he holds our salvation sure. We could never earn, work, beg, give, cry, or anything else enough to make up for our transgression. Yet God, because of his infinite love and never-ending mercy toward us, made us alive in Christ and is saving us What more is there to say? Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Let our gratitude be more than just words. May our every thought, action, sacrifice, prayer, encouragement, warning, everything, our attitude be motivated and energized by sheer gratitude to God the Father for giving his Son, to Christ for giving his life in our stead, and to the Spirit for sealing us in the promise of God forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, this evening. We know, Lord, that you had a plan. We know, Father, that you had this plan from the beginning of time. Jesus, we know that you said, I will go, send me. I will redeem them. I will ransom them. Spirit, you live within us and you remind us, telling us this day, even speaking to us now, that these words are true. We pray that you would work in us to transform us into the image of Christ. Make us more grateful, Lord. Make us more willing. Help us, Lord, to see your love, even in the cross. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We had all turned aside We had all gone astray We had all clenched our fists And refused to obey We had sneered at the truth Turned our backs on the poor Slain our daughters and sons on the altar of war. But the Lord of love still longed to redeem, to renew all creation and wash our hearts clean. So the sovereign of all left his glory behind and the world saw its hope in the face of a child in our exile we wailed in our slavery we groaned Crying out for the king to return to his throne We were thirsty for blood And we all longed for the hour When the nations would fall by the sword of his power But the kingdom of God belongs to the weak, to the humble and gracious, the poor and the meek. So the king held no sword and demanded no crown, and the world saw true power in its ruler bent down. Though our answer had come, we were bound to the night, and we pulled back in fear from the force of his light. We condemned him to die, twisting all he had said, and we scoffed and we cheated as our dear Savior bled. But the love of God no sin could destroy And even as he was pierced, Jesus prayed for our joy Oh, what beautiful grace, oh, what infinite loss When the world saw God's heart in the shape of a cross. The shape of a cross, the symbol of God's immense love for us. Christ's body hung on the cross and he was forsaken by Father in the righteous judgment of God for our sins. Reflecting upon this truth, let us take a moment here in silence now to prepare our hearts for communion. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and after giving thanks for it, broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Every time you take this, remember me. In the same way, after taking the bread, he raised the cup and after giving thanks, he said, all of you, 
drink it. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood. Every time you drink of it, remember me. The death of Christ on the cross, the blood shed, was the sign of a new promise, of a new tomorrow, of grace and forgiveness. The bread representing the death of Christ and what it took to purchase that on our behalf. We're going to begin communion here in a moment. I'll pray for the elements. What I would like, I have Brother Phil here in the back, is we're going to come up, starting at the back rows. He will usher people out. You'll come down the center row where you'll grab a piece of unleavened bread and a cup of juice, and you will go back to your seats. Feel free to take it on your own. If you're in the annex, we'd like you to go around to the back over here and just fit in wherever you go, and then as you're done, you can go back to your seat now. Let's pray for the elements. Blessed are you, O God, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. We thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus shed for us that we might be redeemed. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. We thank you, Lord, for our bread of life, the Lord Jesus and his death on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sacred head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded with thorns, thine only crown. How pale thou art with anguish, with sore abuse and scorn. How does that visage languish, which once was bright as morn? What thou, my Lord, hast suffered was all for sinners' gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. Lo, here I fall, my Savior, tis I deserve thy place. Look on me with thy favor. Assist me with thy grace. What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end? Oh, make me thine forever, and should I fainting be, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love to thee.
is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may I though vile as he wash all my sins away wash all my sins away wash all my sins away and there may I though vile as he wash all my sins away dear dying lamb thy prayer his blood shall never lose its power till all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more be saved to sin no
When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, 
lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud, then, will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. For this last song, I have you guys stand. Men of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude In my place condemned he stood Sealed my pardon with his blood Hallelujah, what a Savior Hallelujah, indeed. Amen? Amen. 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 Tomorrow at 6.30, we're here again downstairs in the Oasis room, kind of in the catacombs of the church, if you will, where we'll be having a silent vigil. As long as you want to stay, you can come, be quiet before the Lord among brothers and sisters. So we encourage you to do that. And then Sunday, Easter's coming. Easter's coming. We have services at 7 a.m., which is one message, and then another message at 9 and 11 we encourage you to come do that. Oh, egg hunt, 1030 in the middle for the kids. They're going to be running around like banshees. We invite you to be there as well.
Let us pray as we close. Oh, Lord Jesus, we, Lord, today you have spoken to our hearts. We pray that this, this transformation, this change that has occurred in us, Lord, would not leave when we leave this place. That, Lord, we would continue to ponder and think, that we would continue to grieve and find grace and find gratitude, Lord, for what you have done. And it is my prayer, Lord, for those who do not know you, that, Lord, you would open their eyes. I pray, Lord, that you would bless my brothers and sisters this night as they go their way. I pray, Lord, help us grieve well and help us to remember that Sunday comes, Easter comes. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and go in peace.